There has been a most astonishing avalanche of theories in recent years scrutinizing political democracy and even modernism as a whole. All of these theories have one resounding sentiment in common, that mob rule, more than anything else, has been responsible for the decline and degeneration of society. From reactionaries to Marxists, there exists a profound disillusionment with the present system. All men of active minds are recognizing the inescapable fact that under democracy, nothing is ever truly safe from the rapacious appetite of the mob, and that even constitutions, no matter how beautiful or well-written, can stop this. The idea that a mere sheet of paper can be enough to eliminate the negative aspects of democracy is folly of the highest order. Such documents can only deter the masses for so long before the promise of free goodies proves too irresistible to ignore. And yet, despite this fatal flaw, there exists a nigh universal worship of democracy, of republicanism, of the system of popularity contests. In this video, I intend to advance a political philosophy that has long been consigned to the dustbin of history. I am, of course, referring to monarchism. In so doing, I shall challenge the modern social democratic system and make the case for monarchy. The veneration of democracy in the Western world has brought about a mentality suggesting that winning an election confers some sort of almost magical legitimacy upon a person, giving him a special moral authority that no one who is not elected can possess. There is a great deal wrong in this view. First of all, winners of elections are never truly the choice of all or even most of the people. They are merely the choice of a majority or plurality of those who happen to show up at the polls on election day. Even assuming that elections genuinely represent the wishes of a majority of a country's population, one should consider whether the typical path to power of a president is really morally superior to that of a king. Politicians, even relatively honest ones, are obliged to engage in a relentless pursuit of funds and to frequently make promises to voters. Conflicts of interest are inevitable. Campaign pledges are likely to prove impossible or contradictory and consequently may be broken. The whole system invites corruption. The successful politician, especially if he is not independently wealthy, must be a smooth talker and a frequent compromiser and deal maker, willing to sacrifice principles for politics. He must be willing to step on others to get ahead, constantly attacking his rivals. If a politician is not dishonest or mean-spirited at the beginning of his career, he runs the risk of becoming so as he immerses himself in the real world of politics. The hereditary sovereign is free from all of this. The fact that he did not have to do anything good to earn his position also means that he did not have to do anything bad. Some kings may very well be terrible, but while monarchy offers at least a chance that a decent and well-meaning person will achieve the top post, democracy virtually ensures such a person will not. There is also the matter of experience. A king is trained to rule the moment he is born. He generally has many years to prepare for the task of governing his country, and when he comes to the throne can concentrate entirely on putting this knowledge to use. He will typically have had access to the best minds and most learned authorities in the country. In contrast, politicians spend the first part of their careers acquiring power and, once in office, must devote a considerable amount of time to keeping it. The constant need to curry favor with special interest groups does not necessarily coincide with what is good for the country. A king can act according to his conscience. A president must always worry about what the polls and commentators say. In short, monarchs are free to do what they believe is right, while politicians are too blighted by the concern of getting re-elected and instead do what is popular. Next, the economic or financial argument. While on this topic, a simple matter must be addressed. Monarchs have often been criticized for spending large amounts of money on projects which did not appear to benefit the general public, typically constructing opulent palaces for their comfort and lavishly funding the arts for their entertainment. Yet aside from the fact that this royal extravagance provided jobs for generations of architects, artisans, musicians, dancers, and artists, what have been its long-term consequences? Some of the most beautiful buildings ever built 
much of the greatest music ever written, incomparable art treasures, magnificent dance traditions, the unparalleled enrichment of Europe's and the world's cultural heritage must rank as one of monarchy's greatest achievements. Even when the arts were not directly linked with royal patronage, by favoring excellence over equality, monarchy tends to foster an atmosphere which is more conducive than republicanism to high artistic achievement. Now that we have addressed this criticism, let us delve further in the realm of economics and turn to the theories of Hans Hermann Hoppe, an economist of the Austrian school. In his book, Democracy, the God that Failed, an interesting economic theory is posited that argues for monarchy over democracy. His theory can be summarized thusly. In a monarchy, the realm is the private property of the monarch. The benefit of this is that the monarch would have an incentive in running the state efficiently and effectively as it would be his own property to be passed down to his children. The monarchy would also be able to take the long view of the realm's affairs, rather than the short-term view the electoral system forces on prime ministers and presidents. Monarchical and democratic government are comparable to two ways of managing property, analogous respectively to private and public ownership. Because the monarch directly owns the government, he has an incentive to maintain and grow his country's value. On the other hand, a democratic leader is merely a temporary caretaker who will be more likely to think in terms of getting the most out of the country, usually at the expense of its value. In Hopp's words, in contrast to a king, a president will want to maximize not total government wealth, but current income, regardless and at the expense of capital values. A king will want to avoid exploiting his subjects so heavily as to reduce his future earnings potential to such an extent that the present value of his estate actually falls. The final topic that I wish to address in this video is the spiritual and symbolic meaning of monarchy. Monarchs are not merely sovereigns or wielders of executive power, but living representatives of the history and culture of their nations. Because they have no loyalty with any political party or interest group, they can exercise unbiased judgment and stand above politics. They are anointed by God, defenders of the faith, arbiters over all things spiritual and temporal. Their symbolic significance cannot be overstated, for their character and actions define the state. Politicians are judged independently, and the actions of one do not speak for them all. Monarchs are not treated so leniently. They must strive for excellence in all that they do, and in so striving, achieve excellence for the country. Eyes are constantly watching them, so much so that their private and public lives are indistinguishable. All of these pressures and duties are what make true statesmen, in contrast to the irresponsible rabble which rule us today. Republican power is based on popularity at best or brute force at worst. Monarchical power, on the other hand, is based on the miracle of birth and the guiding hand of God. As God simply puts it in Proverbs chapter 8 verse 15, By me kings reign, and princes decree justice.